right. Hey, well, good morning, IBC. It is great to be with you. My name is Jason Stein. I'm one of the pastors here on staff. And it's your first time visiting. We are so glad that you are here with us. As Jeremiah mentioned, we're continuing in our sermon series called The Story of God, where we're looking at how this diverse collection of writings and stories in the Bible tells one unified and compelling story about who God is, who we are, and what it means to follow him. That we believe this story about God and us gives us answers to life's deepest questions. And so as a church this year, our, our theme, our focus is we wanna go deep in our discipleship journey. And one of the ways we wanna go deep is by going deep in our understanding and love for scripture. And so we'll be spending time with these next few weeks looking through the big story of the Bible, making our way through and seeing what it tells us about God and ourselves and our part we play in the world today. And like every great story, every great story follows a pattern, that there's a setting, that there's an introduction that introduces us to the central characters. And after that, that introduction, that setting, it's followed by uh, an inciting incident, that, that conflict is introduced into the story, that there's a tension that's introduced into the story. And then from that inciting incident, you get the rising action how that conflict unfolds throughout the chapters of the story until it reaches the, the climax where, where that conflict, that tension is resolved in the story. And then finally, you come to the resolution, the happily ever after part of a story. And the Bible follows this pattern. And as Barry taught us in week one, God is the central character of the Bible. And that in Genesis, we learn that the Bible is all about God and that he created human beings. He created you and me to be made in his image. And what that means is that you are made with infinite worth, value, and dignity. And that you have a purpose to play in God's story. And then last week, Barry introduced us to the fall where we see that sin and shame enter the picture and how we've been dealing with sin and shame ever since. So creation, fall, and then what's next on the plot line, what's next in the story of scripture is election. And I'm not talking about political elections. I'm talking about God's choosing of Abram and Israel as a special object of attention and affection to carry forward his plan in the world. And so today we're gonna to look at Genesis chapter 12 and see that God has a redemptive plan in the world and that you have a part to play in God's plan in the world. So if you have a Bible, let's go Genesis chapter 12. And as you're turning there, let me give you a little backstory about what's happening in Genesis 12 and a few chapters before that. I believe that Genesis 12 is the background to the entire Bible that if you don't understand Genesis, you will get the Bible wrong. That, that Genesis is the pivotal chapter within the entire Old Testament. The entire Old Testament turns because of Genesis 12. That this one chapter sets the stage for God's mission and redemptive plan that we will trace throughout the rest of the scriptures. Genesis 12 is pivotal. And the one question that hangs over Genesis 4 through 11, the one question that hangs over the chapters that comes before Genesis 12 is this. God, what are you doing to respond to the problem of sin? God, what are you doing to respond to the mess that humanity has made? That after the fall, the following chapters in Genesis, it is a downward spiral of sin and shame and rebellion that sin has run amok that Adam and Eve, lying, hiding, blaming, Cain and Abel, murder. Noah started out strong into drunken naked. Not a great look, right? Uh, downward spiral of sin and shame. So the question of Genesis is, God, what are you gonna do to respond to the sin? God, do you have a plan to fix this? And I think for many of us, as we scroll through our Facebook feed, Sometimes that same question pops up into our, our mind. God, this is a mess. Do you have a plan to fix it? Maybe you think about your marriage, going, God, this marriage is a mess. Can you fix it? Maybe you think about your wayward kid. God, this is a mess. Can you fix it? My career, my, re my relationships, my reputation, whatever it is, God, it, it's a mess. 
Can you fix this mess? Do you have a plan? And Genesis 12 is God's response to the problem of sin and shame and brokenness in the world. The first 11 chapters of the Bible are all about this cosmic scope. But then by the end of chapter 11, the storyteller of Genesis draws our attention to one family, an ordinary family living ordinary lives in an ordinary place. And that God elects, he chooses to do something extraordinary through this one family that changes the entire world. So look with me, Genesis chapter 12, verse one, it says this. So the Lord had said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land that I will show you. And I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you and I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went as the Lord had told him and Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. And he took his wife, Sarai, his nephew, Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran. And they set out for the land of Canaan and they arrived there. Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Morah at Shechem. And at the time of the Canaanites were in the land. And the Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your offspring, I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. And from there, he went on towards the hills east of Bethel and he pitched his tent. And and with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east, there he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. And so here in Genesis 12, we're introduced to a brand new character, a character named Abram. We don't know a lot about Abram or his backstory or his family. We know that he lived in the land of Haran, what we would call modern day southeastern Turkey. And that the people in the land of Haran, they worshiped pagan gods. They worshiped the moon god to be specific. And what we know is that that Abram and his wife, Sarai, that they are old and barren. And to be without kids in the ancient world was to be hopeless. To be without kids in the ancient world was to be without a secure future. To be without a promise of hope, a promise of a good future. And so the Lord, he appears to Abram, a pagan worshiper, and he calls him for a larger purpose. That God chooses Abram, what what fancy theologians call election. An election, again, is simply God choosing a, a person or people as his special object of attention and affection. And so here God elects, he chooses Abram to be the object of his attention and affection, not because of anything significant or special about Abram, but because of God's gracious character and plan for the world. And so the Lord appears to Abram, an ordinary man living his ordinary life in the land of Haran and tells him to leave his tribe, to leave his gods, to leave his home, to leave everything he knows behind and to travel to a location, travel to a place that God will show him that he's never been before. Y'all, this is a crazy story, right? Imagine if you were in your 70s, you're enjoying retirement living the good life, maybe playing with the grandkids, maybe driving the RV around the country. I hear that's what people do, right? Um, And God comes to you and he says, leave it all behind. Abandon it all. Everything you know, everything you've planned for, everything that's comfortable to you, leave it all behind because I have a larger purpose for you. How would you react Would you ignore the invite? Would you go uh, begrudgingly, anxiously? How would you react to that? Notice something. God doesn't give Abram a ton of details. He doesn't come to Abram and tell him where to go, what direction to walk in, or even his final destination. He doesn't give Abram any of those details. And I don't know about you, I'm someone, I really like details. I wanna know all the steps to the plan, lay out the instructions for me. That I believe God has created two types of people in the world. The first are type A control freaks. And the second is just everybody else. And I am a type A person. I want all the details and the plans. And there are two off the charts type A people in my family. 
two off the chart type A people, and it shows up most prominently on family vacations. Um, those two people are my sweet wife and my uncle. Um, I have never known anyone to create a vacation itinerary broken down into 15 minute time segments with built in bathroom breaks. Right? This is crazy. Uh, my wife, she gave up on creating these vacation itineraries and schedules because only her and my uncle were following them. The rest of us, we were on the beach having drinks, enjoying ourselves a great time, right? The point is, we all like some detail. We all want some details to the plan. We want God to map out our dating journey, our career path. He wanted to map out our life force and assure us that it's safe and secure, happy and healthy. And we don't want any detours or rerouting or delays, please. But notice something. That's not what God invites Abram into. God doesn't invite Abram to follow turn-by-turn directions in Google. What he invites Abram to is step-by-step faith. He invites Abram into a faith journey. Here's my point. God rarely gives you all the details. God rarely gives you all the details. Instead, he invites you into a faith journey. He says, I want you to be a part of my work in the world. Do you trust me enough to follow where I lead? Trusting God's plans and his purposes is hard when you can't see what's ahead. That the call of discipleship on your life and on my life is a call to an ever-deepening trust in God. That growing in dependence upon him, even when we don't have all the details or instructions we would like, right? So many of us want to live our lives independent and God is saying, no, I invite you to live into a deepening dependence upon me. And that God wants to use Abram to fix what's broken in the world. And so he says, Abram, do you trust me? Do you trust me enough to follow where I lead? That every faith journey has a larger purpose and requires a step of faith. Again, look back what happens next in verse two. It says, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you and I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you. And whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. That here, God gives Abram a special promise. And we have to ask, what's so special about this promise? It's special because it's a covenant promise. The word covenant simply means it's about relationships and promises. Relationships mean I am committed to you and a promise that I will do what I say I will do. And here, God is making a covenant promise to Abram, a covenant promise about family, land, and blessing to Abram and his offspring. And again, in the ancient world, family and land were everything. So think back, when's the last time you saw those themes of family and land and blessing in the Genesis story? He was back in the garden. That, that This is what God commanded Adam and Eve to be fruitful, to multiply, to cultivate and care for the land. But this time here in Genesis 12, God comes to Abram and says, hey, what I commanded in the garden, I now promise that I will accomplish. I will carry that forward. I will do that. See that after the fall, God could have abandoned humanity. After sin and mess and rebellion, God could have said, you guys are too messy. I'm walking away. I'm abandoning you guys. Forget this. But he doesn't. God doesn't abandon people in their mess, that he pursues his good but broken creation, that he pursues you and me, that his grace and his character doesn't give up on us. And God does not give up on you and your mess. And some of you need to let that truth be tattooed onto your soul this morning, that God will not abandon you in your mess, that he leans into your mess because of his character and his love and his mercy and his covenant promises. And so God says, what humanity couldn't do in the garden, I promise to do. I promise to accomplish. He says, Abram, you have no family. You have no land. But one day, I will give you a family. One day, you will have land. One day, your offspring will become a great nation, the nation of Israel. And God says, I I choose, I elect to use Israel 
to be the means by which I carry out my rescue mission in the world. That from the lineage of Abram comes Christ, the Savior, the Messiah, the one true King. Galatians 3.14 says this, that he redeemed us in order that the blessings given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. As Barry taught us last week, that God has a dream for a world set right, and it begins right here in Genesis chapter 12. So what's so special about this promise? It's a covenant promise. Second, it's a covenant promise for all peoples. That this is a promise for all peoples that from the very beginning, God's plan has always been about all nations, all peoples of the earth. That that word peoples there in that passage, it's this idea of of ethnos, nations, ethnicities. Well, we see that from the very beginning, God had a plan and a mission. And it was a multi-ethnic plan and mission for, for every person, men, women, boys and girls from every background, culture, tribe, and nation, drawing them together into one new humanity and saving faith in Christ and inviting them to join his mission in the world. I love how Pastor Derwin Gray puts it. He says this. He says, so through Abram, whom God renamed Abraham, meaning father of many, all the families, the ethnic groups on earth would be blessed by the gospel and be included in Abraham's family through faith in Jesus of Nazareth, Israel's Messiah. That through Abraham, the nation of Israel was birthed and they corporately had the sacred vocation of being the light to the Gentiles. That God's dream for a world set right is a multi-ethnic dream. And that through one family, one nation, that God wants to bless all nations, all the people of the earth. And that if you are in Christ, if you're a follower of Jesus today, that you are a recipient of these blessings in Christ. So what's so special about this promise? It's a covenant promise. It's a covenant promise for all peoples. And it's a promise in which you have a part to play. That you have a special part to play in God's mission and plan in the world. I believe that we all wanna be a part of something larger than ourselves, a story greater than ourselves, that we all wanna leave a legacy and know that we've made an impact on the lives of the people around us and the places we inhabited. There's some recent research showing that um, millennials and Gen Z, that they're choosing careers and vocation paths that, that earn them less money, but give them a greater sense of purpose give them a greater sense that they're making an impact on the world. And I believe that longing in the human heart is not just for the TikTok generation. I believe that longing in the human heart is in all of us. That all of us, in big ways and small ways, God has wired us to want to make a difference, to want to lean into a larger story beyond ourselves. You see, the story of Abram, the blessing of Abram was never just about Abram. The blessing of Israel was never just about Israel. The blessing of the church was never just about the church. It's more than that. It's way bigger than that. IBC is never supposed to be just about IBC, right? That our vision statement that God has called us to be a multi-ethnic movement of missionary disciples formed in the way of Jesus for the sake of of the world. It is always for the sake of the world. Dietrich Bonhoeffer says this. He says, the church is only the church when it exists for others. Here's what that means. That your discipleship journey with Jesus is not just about you and Jesus. It's also for the sake of the people and places around you. That like Abraham, we have been blessed by God. And again, like Abram, the blessings that you and I receive in life from God are never just about us. That the blessings that that you have are for the sake of others. I think so often our definition of blessing doesn't align with God's definition of blessing. I think so often our definition of blessing usually involves our comfort, but God's definition of blessing is about his plans his presence, his purpose with his people. That God's definition of blessing is about his presence and his purpose with his people. That what you and I need most in life is not more comfort. We need a greater awareness of God's presence and purpose in our life. That's what it means to be blessed by God. 
God doesn't want your life to be a reservoir of his blessings, but a conduit which his blessings flow from of kindness and grace and justice and generosity and mercy that flows onto the lives of others. God says, don't store up the blessings, be a conduit which the blessings flow onto others because it's not just about you. My plan and my purposes in the world involve you and you are the means by which I wanna accomplish, I wanna advance my kingdom in the world. And I believe God continues to choose ordinary men and women and boys and girls today like you and like me to do extraordinary things to accomplish his will and his mission in the world today. That that where you see brokenness in the world, God says, I wanna fix that and I wanna use you. Where you see a lack of of hope, where you see pain and brokenness and shame and despair, God says, I wanna fix that. I wanna bring shalom to that and I wanna use you to do it that you are the means by which God wants to bless the world in and through the Lord Jesus. I know some of you might think, God can't use me. That my background disqualifies me. My story is too messy. Oh, I don't know enough Bible, so God can't use me. Oh, I don't have any skills that God would want to use. Can I just say, those are lies from the enemy. There is nothing you have and can offer to God that he won't use. Again, you are made in his image and you are made to partner with him for the flourishing of the world. Here at IBC, we talk a lot about using your time, your talent, and your treasure. That looks like volunteering with our local partners. That that looks like jumping in and serving and volunteering in our community. That looks like recognizing you have a neighbor in need and going over and offering to help. It looks like seeing where there's pain and brokenness in people's lives and saying, God, do you wanna use me to help fix that? Right, there's so many ways in which God's inviting us to join his mission, to join his kingdom work in the world. If we just open our eyes and take our eyes off of ourselves just for a moment, we will see the ways in which God wants to use us. So God calls Abram, he elects Abram, he blesses Abram, he makes a covenant promise to Abram And then look at Abram's response, starting in verse four. It says this. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife, Sarai, his nephew, Lot, and all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran. And they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Abram didn't know where he was going. He didn't know what he was going to face. But he knew that God had called him. He knew that God was inviting him to go step by step in faith. And so in faith, he went. In faith, he traveled from the land of Haran to the land of Canaan. The distance between those two locations is about 500 miles. That would be like us walking from here in Irving to South Padre Island. That is a crazy distance on foot that if you drive a car, you can do it in about nine hours, depending upon if you think the speed limit is a law or a suggestion. It's a law. I'm being recorded. It's a law, right? Um, Nine hours driving, but Abram walked it one step after the other. That the average person can walk about 2,000 steps in a mile. Now, I know some of you um, who do CrossFit in Camp Gladiator, that you can cover that distance a little more quickly. And the reason I know is you're always telling us and everybody else. We know you can close your apple rings, just chill, right? The average person, 2,000 steps in a mile. If my math is correct, Abram took 1 million steps. 1 million steps traveling based on a promise God had given him. And I have to imagine that's 1 million steps where there are opportunities for doubt, opportunities for uncertainty, opportunities for anxiety, opportunities where Abram begins to doubt God. God, are you real? God, are you good? God, God, are you faithful? God, do you see me? God, do you remember me? God, do you know me? God, are your promises true and faithful and trustworthy? Step by step. In faith. I want to tell you that the promise is only as good as the promise maker. 
And that the story of Genesis, the story of the Bible is that God is good and true and faithful, that his promises are trustworthy. Psalm 111 says this, that the works of his hands are faithful. Say the word faithful and just, and all his precepts are trustworthy. Say trustworthy. They are established forever and ever, enacted in faithfulness and uprightness, that he provided redemption for his people. He ordained his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and all who follow his precepts have good understanding. To him belongs eternal praise. That as Abram takes step by step in faith, one million steps along the way, he creates altars of worship. That every step deepened Abraham's faith and his commitment and his trust in the Lord. And that deepening commitment and faith caused Abram to respond in worship to God. And the same is true for you and for me today. That God is inviting us to hear his voice, to respond to his call, to recognize that God wants to use us in his mission to rescue and renew his good but broken creation. He invites us to take those steps in faith and follow him and to deepen our commitment and worship of him in the process. Friends, like Abram, that we are called. We're called to respond in faith and to join his redemptive work in the world. This week, as I've been uh, praying and thinking through this message, I've been praying for you, praying that for some of you, that um, you would take one step of faith this week. I don't know what, what season of life you were in. I don't know your circumstances in life, but my prayer for you is that you would take one step of faith in God this week. For others of you, I know that some of you in this room, um, you really struggle to trust God. You really struggle to find him to be good and faithful and true. And my prayer for you this week has been that you today would begin to see God is good and beautiful and true and trustworthy, that his character is kind toward you, towards you, that you wouldn't let your circumstances shape how you see God, but you would let God's faithfulness shape how you see your circumstances, that you would find him true even in your struggle. So I just want to end by just offering you just two reflection questions. And the first question is this. Do you trust God? Do you trust God enough to follow where he leads you? What's that one thing that God is inviting you to to let go of? To maybe leave behind? To abandon? To step into the unknown? To trust him? Do you trust him enough? to follow where he's leading you in this season. And then the second question is simply this. What is your one next step, right? What is your one next step that God is inviting you to take? That every single one of us, no matter your age, no matter your background, no matter your skill set, no matter what your story is, all of us, God is inviting to play a part in his plan to rescue the world that you have a part to play. So the question is, what's that step that God is inviting you to take? What's that one next step that you can take this week to join his mission in the world? Let's pray. So Father, you are good and you are gracious that you do not abandon us and leave us in the mess of sin, but that you have a plan to fix what is broken and that you invite us to join you in that mission. And so Lord, for every person here, I pray that you would help them to deepen their trust in you. I pray that you would show each person here this morning what their one next step is to join your mission in the world. Lord, would you meet us in this moment? Would you make your presence and your purposes for us real and tangible now? We pray this in the strong name of Jesus. Amen.